Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Henderson. Let's give Jesus a hand of praise. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and it is good to have Bethany with me. She flew in yesterday morning, so she might be experiencing a little bit of jet lag. She flew in from uh, Dallas, but we just uh, had a great time being together, and I'm glad she was able to join me. She loves Jesus with all of her heart, yes. and uh, she uh, she looks like she's in her early 20s, but she's uh, she's almost 18. Huh? Don't tell them. Sorry. Don't tell. Oh, oops. <laughs> all right. You want to tell she should do better. Maybe she'll just preach. You may be seated. Oh, it's so good to be here. You know, Texas or California, no matter where we are, we serve the same God, and he is so good. Oh, he's so good. You know, you were talking about, uh, we were reading from, I believe it was Psalms this morning, and oh, one of my favorite verses talks about every morning he loadeth us with blessings. And in my head, I just think of every morning God just gets his dump truck and backs it all up into my life, right? Yeah. Every morning he just says, all right, here you go. And he gives me blessings every day. So good. He gives us mercies, sick or not, wherever we are. Oh, he's so good. And I thank him today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know, I could have listened to you all day, Pastor. I, he never ceases to, to just uh, come out with these amazing thoughts. And, uh, of course, it made me buckle over with laughter and, uh, you know, Bethany, you might be called to preach, too. <laughs> it's in the blood. My, you know, Grammy's sister, my aunt, was a preacher, a hot, fiery evangelist. So, amen. Uh, I want to direct your attention to Ezekiel 43. And, Pastor, that second service is at 4, right? Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, we're, there's, there's some, as he said, deep prophecy fulfillment happening and we're going to get into that, and uh, I'm so delighted to see your, your new projector, praise God. <laughs> now, why are you laughing? <laughs> That's a blessing. <laughs> you all know me too well. You know me too well. Amen. Ezekiel 43. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You know, I didn't put that in my, uh, let me go to it, because I put the reference Ezekiel 40, never, never mind, 1 Corinthians 14, sorry, 1 Corinthians 14 and 10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Say this verse with me again, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Look, your neighbor, tell them none of them. Look at your other neighbor, tell them God's voice is the most important voice. Let's lift our hands. Jesus, we thank you today for what you're doing. And what you're going to do, loose the power of your word. And everybody said in Jesus' name. You may be seated. My title is Voices and Choices. Voices and Choices. And in order to make the right choices, we must hear the right voices. I cannot make the right choices if I'm listening to the wrong voices. There is absolutely no voice more important in your life and in my life than the voice of our Creator, Jesus Christ. I was not raised in church, but thankfully, and I may have told you this before, but thankfully I was 
still a teenager when I was filled with the Holy Ghost. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I told you this, so I'll make it brief. But I was 15 years old, and you may remember when I spoke on the seven trumpets, when I got to trumpet number four and I talked about earthquakes, I talked about how I was just seeking the Holy Ghost, and I, I don't even know if I'd been baptized in Jesus' name yet, but I took, and a lot of people have asked me how I got interested in Bible prophecy, and my answer has always been, well, it was simultaneous with my conversion. I just, and you know, a lot of people are interested in prophecy, and that's a good thing, but I, I seem to take, uh, it, just, it, it just naturally fit with me, and I was reading Matthew 24, and of course, you know, I grew up in San Jose, so like you all, uh, I grew up feeling earthquakes from time to time. Most of them were small, a few big ones, or pretty big ones. But when I read Matthew 24, and I came to the verse where Jesus said there would be earthquakes in the last days in divers places, that struck a, a chord in me. And, of course, I was a sophomore in high school, and everything was brand new to me. I mean, I'd read the Bible before, but not like this. You know, not, not like in a Holy Ghost atmosphere hearing Holy Ghost preaching and just the whole nine yards. And so I read that verse of Scripture, and I went to bed. It was a school night. I hit the sack, and I was sleeping like a rock. Really, talk about rocks, Pastor. I was sleeping like a rock. I was, I was dead out. And all of a sudden, I remember it like it was yesterday. This was 1986, so thirty year, a little more than 30 years ago. And a voice, I'm talking about voices, a voice woke me up. And it was a very, it was just a few words. It wasn't even a complete sentence. Well, I guess it was. Let this be a message from God. That's all the voice said. Let this be a message from God. It was not in my head. It was audible. It filled my bedroom in our little house in San Jose, it was not my dad. I didn't have a brother. It was a male voice. It wasn't my dog, and it wasn't my parakeet. Let this be a message from God. It was a pleasant voice. It was a kind voice, but it was a confident voice, and it filled the room. It was loud enough to wake me up. And remember, I was in a dead sleep, and the voice woke me up, and I sat up in bed, and I st- I distinctly remember looking at my, I had a a digital alarm clock. That was a big deal back then. And it was a bright red digital alarm clock, and it was was exactly 4 a.m. And I'm sitting there. Now, I sit up in bed. It was dead silent. Nothing happened. There was no other noises. And I just sat there. And the peace of God filled my room. I had also prayed the night before. And, And I just sat there. Well, then I I, I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and nothing happened. But I, I thought about what the voice said. Let this be a message from God. And I almost laid back down, and all of a sudden, one of the largest earthquakes we had in years struck, and our entire house began to shake and quake, and I thought the windows were gonna bust out. Now, that was, that was three years before the 1989, the big one. That was three years before, so it wasn't that big, but it was big, pretty big. And, but that, that, it's like God was speaking to me. You, and I know the Bible says he's not always in the earthquake and in all the other stuff, but in this case, for me, he was. And it's like God was using that. He was confirming his word. And I, re- as the house was shaking, I remembered the verse of Scripture I just had read like six hours earlier before hitting the sack. And it's like, here I am a brand new Christian. Everything about Pentecost was brand new to me. I'm a teenager. But it's like God, what, God knows how to speak to us. God's voice is real. The problem is we don't always discern God's voice. And yes, the Bible says that sometimes God's voice is a still, small voice. And sometimes we're so busy that we don't take time to hear the voice of God. My grandmother was a very devout, committed Pentecostal. 
Uh, she spent most of her life going to uh, uh, the Stockton Church, but uh, she actually got the Holy Ghost in Santa Maria, but she, she, she was a quiet woman, but a woman of prayer. It was actually my grandmother, my dad's mother, uh, she was very instrumental. God used her to help establish me in my walk in, in the 80s. And back then, we actually used to get out pieces of paper. And back then, we had pens with ink in them. And we used to write letters. And we actually used to put them in an envelope with a stamp and put it in the mailbox. You know? Now we just text everything, right? But but uh, my grandmother and I would write letters back and forth, and she would just, they were simple, but she would send me the, it's like when I would get the letter in the mailbox for my grandmother, it was only two hours away, but I would open it, and it would have, you know, one or two scriptures, and it's like she had just the right words to help me understand a certain part of the Bible. But my grandmother told me, she said, Craig, don't get all fancy in your prayers. Just talk to Jesus like you would talk to your best friend. And, you know, God wants to hear our voice. Amen. But it's she shared a story with me. And my father, uh, who she raised in church, had, when he went to college at San Jose State, he drifted for a while. Good man, but he drifted for a while. And my grandmother, as naturally you would expect, began to take on, of course, as any mother would for her own son, a deep burden for my dad. And she was praying and seeking God, calling uh, on the name of the Lord for my dad. And she said one night she was laying in bed next to my grandfather. Now, this is going way back to the early 60s when my dad was in college. And she said the audible voice, talking about voices, the audible voice of the Holy Ghost spoke to her. And again, it was nothing complex. It was very simple. She, but she said it was audible. And, and, and all the Lord said was, I have heard your prayers. And she said the following Sunday, Sunday, without prompting for, from her, she didn't say a word to my dad. She said, my dad went to the Pentecostal church in San Jose and went to the altar and prayed through and was speaking in tongues and began dancing about the place. And so God's voice is real. God's voice can crush the enemy. God's voice can destroy doubt. I'm all for education. I have nothing against these good doctors that teach at seminaries as long as they're teaching truth. I have nothing against anybody who pursues master de master's degrees and PhDs. That's all wonderful. We need to know. We need to learn. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But hear this preacher. There is no replacement for you and I getting alone with God and hearing his voice. Hallelujah. Whether it's a whisper, Samuel, Samuel. And he goes into Eli. What? Go back to bed, son. Samuel, Samuel. Eli, are you calling me? And Eli perceived that's God speaking to Samuel. Go back to bed, and when the Lord speaks, when you it'll be the Lord. And you say, here am I, Lord. God was preparing a prophet for Israel. But before Samuel could become a prophet, he had to learn the voice of Almighty God for himself. In 2017, let us make it our top priority to pursue Jesus Christ because we love him, because we want to know him. It's not a competition. Put that in all caps. We are not, capital N-O-T, we are not in competition with each other. Amen. It's not who can shout the loudest. We love to shout, and we should, but it's not who can hit the highest decibels because we're all in this together. You know, as we were singing, the beauty of the harmony, 
It's like the whole congregation, Pastor, was the choir. And some of the songs you sang this morning are very familiar to me, and tears began to fill my eyes as I had my hands raised right up here on the front row, and I began to feel the presence of God. And it's like I began to hear all of you sing, and of course the praise singers up here and the musicians. But behind me, you all singing, there was this perfect harmony. It was like the angels of heaven singing. Seriously. Seriously, I'm not trying to exaggerate because God's presence, his voice was harmonized with our voice. I believe there, there's angels in this building and the Bible says they desire to look into what we have. They want what you have. Look at your neighbor, tell them they want what you have. If you have the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can have it right now today. Many voices in the world. That's what we read. Many voices in the world. In our text in 1 Corinthians. So many voices. Pulling for our attention. Pulling for our time. A lot of the voices are good voices. They're not all bad voices. Some of them are. But again, you can't make good choices unless you're listening to the right voices. That is why, young people, your chief textbook needs to be the Bible. But that goes for all of us. The Word of God is His voice to us. You know, some of the most devout Christians may go their entire life and never hear the audible voice of God. And, that, and, and the voice I told you about for me was I, what I believe to be an angel because he was talking about God. I don't think I personally have ever heard the audible voice of God. Now, maybe I have and I didn't know it. Would not be tragic to hear God's voice and not know it. It's like you, Pastor, talking about the Lord skipping over somebody, not because he doesn't love that person, but because he's looking for the people that are pursuing him. You want to hear God's voice. Make up your mind to pursue him, that nothing's going to get in your way. You're like that Mario Andretti on the racetrack, and you've got a goal in mind. Or you're like that, maybe sometimes as Christians, we're more like that marathon runner. And it's a 26-mile trek. But nothing's going to get in your way. Nothing's going to stop you. You may feel like fainting at times. Excuse the illustration, but your former governor... Arnold Schwarzenegger. I remember listening to a documentary he did. And he said while all while everybody else was out partying, he was in the gym trying to reach his goals. I'm not saying he's a perfect man at all. But I remember a statement he made and I don't mean to gross you out. He said there were times he worked out so hard he would throw up while he's working out. That's gross and disgusting, I know. But then he said he would just keep going. And it's like, if your mind is made up, it doesn't matter what tries to deter you. The world thinks nothing of pursuing their goals. Why should we hesitate to pursue Jesus Christ with everything we've got? God gave us all a voice. And I don't want to digress into what would just seem to be a nonchalant Bible study, but I want to deal with some very particular voices. And the first, because the Bible says there are many voices in the world, and the first voice I want to tackle is our own human voice. God gave us all a voice. Some people use their voice to talk a lot. You know somebody that is a chatterbox. Maybe that's you. (laughs) Maybe that's your spouse. (laughs) 
Maybe that's someone you work next to. And they don't, it seems like they don't know how to stop this jaw and this thing that the Bible in the book of James addresses in the mouth called the tongue. That is a world of iniquity. But the Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now think about this for, for just a moment. God gave us our vocal cords. God gave us the ability to speak. But the ability to speak is directly connected to what the Bible calls the heart, which not referring to the physical blood pump that circulates blood throughout your body and your veins, but the heart in that reference, in most references in the Bible, is talking about the seat of the soul, the inner sanctum of the core of who you are, which is really in the mind, which of course may distribute itself all throughout the body, but God forbid you could chop my arm off and I can still live, but you chop my head off and I can't live, I'm sorry, so The soul, the heart is really in the brain within the skull cavity, but within that part of who I am, there's what the Bible calls the heart, the inner sanctum of of what I am. But the only way I can convey that to you, the last time I checked, you can't read my mind. Now, if you can, you would probably be a multimillionaire. You could make a lot of money. God forbid that we would ever use it for that purpose, though. But unless you're operating in the word of knowledge, which we all believe in the gifts of the Spirit, I have to open my mouth to tell you what I'm thinking. Now, how many wonderful married couples do we have in the house today? That's a lot of hands. So you deeply love your spouse, and you're wonderfully happy in your relationship. But have you ever had, now, no couples here in this room ever have conflict or arguments, right? You never have disagreements. You never have times where you just don't, you're not on the same same wavelength. But, okay, men, let me just talk to you for a second. Have you ever had a situation where Your wife expected something out of you, and you didn't get it. And you turned to her and said, I can't read your mind. You may have said it with a little more zest than that. Talk to me. Or maybe you wives said that to your husband. Because they're usually the talkers. Oh, I'm getting myself in trouble now, Pastor. The Bible says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. What are you trying to say, preacher? I can't read your mind, and you can't read my mind. So, if you want a good marriage, you got to talk to each other. I know sometimes we just need to shut up, but you know what? You know, and we're, we men are the worst about it. We expect our wives to read our mind, you know. It's like because we tend to be conquerors. So when the wedding's over, what's up? You know, we, we, we come home from work. We want to kick our feet up on the coffee table and just chill out and relax. And the wives want to talk about the day. And you're like, give me a break. I just want to relax. I just got out of an hour of commute traffic with people cutting me off and riding my bumper. But if you don't ever talk, you will not have a good relationship. You cannot expect to get to know somebody if you don't ever talk to them. Same with God. You want to know the Lord? You, you, want to, you wonder why you're struggling? Now, we all struggle. Preachers struggle. 
but you can reach a place in your walk with God when you have gained victory over the things that try to distract you and destroy you and hold you back. And if you never use your voice to talk to the one who saved you, and yet you scratch your head and wonder, why am I still struggling with the same temptations, with the same things, with the same addictions? There's something powerful when we use our voices to praise him. Praise breaks the chains of hell. But the voice that God gave us really is an amazing thing. But what did Jesus say? I think I quoted it earlier. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is why God chose speaking with other tongues as the evidence of the indwelling of his spirit. It's not something we make up or invent. (laughs) I mean, I know there's fakes out there. I get that. But when God comes in, it may seem like foolishness to men. But when you're really in the presence of God and he comes upon you and he comes in you, I can't explain it from a natural perspective. You just have to experience it. And that natural tongue, whether it's English or Espanol or French or German or some other language. There's dozens of languages. It doesn't matter. When you read the book of Acts, now in the book of Acts, not only was it a personal witness to the individual that God has come in, but there were also Parthians and Medes and Elimelites and many other groups of people from other countries and nearby areas that came to witness and to see the miracle. And they said, wait a minute, they're speaking my language, but they don't know my language. How did they know my language? They never went to college or school to learn my language, but they're speaking my language. And what God did then, he can do today. He can do today. And he's still doing it. There's nothing more beautiful. We sang about the blood, the power of the blood this morning. And that is the beginning of the regeneration. That is the beginning of the renewal. That is the beginning of the connecting point. Coupled together with commitment and determination and repentance. But oh God will not just come in and clean house. We have a barn on our place in Dallas. And I'm thankful for our barn. But our barn is pregnant with stuff with outgrown, clothes we've outgrown and just stuff. We need to have a big yard sale, Pastor. A big old, yeah, in Dallas. We need to have a big old yard sale. Our barn is just filled with stuff. And one day, I'm going to get rid of all that stuff. (laughs) I keep saying that every year, don't I, Bethany? But the Bible talks about when the evil spirit is gone out of a man. And it's all, he comes in, he finds it swept and garnished. But then over time, skipping over a few details, if he doesn't get what he really needs in the house, wouldn't it be dull and boring to just live in an empty house, just sleep on a sleeping bag on the floor? Now, I, I'm not mocking the poor. I get it. Some people don't have money to go buy furniture, but I'm making a point. You want some furniture. You want some couches, and you want some beds and mattresses and all of that. In other words, the Lord didn't just call us to repentance. He called us to live an overcoming life. He doesn't just empty us out of the old man, but he renews us and fills us with what he originally intended for us to have, the fruit of his spirit, the gifts of his spirit, a victorious, joyous, abundant life. There's a lot of sincere Christians 
There's thousands upon thousands of them all around L.A. And I'm sure in their hearts, they love God. I wouldn't take that away from them for anything. But you and I, without at the risk of sounding condescending, it's really not. You and I know that until they receive what you and I have, the wonderful, glorious, free gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they are not complete. And as Pastor said, therein lies a great challenge. I remember here when Brother Johnny Godair said he went to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. He said that was his problem. Everybody was saved. Everybody he talked to, oh, I'm saved. I have my church. Well, that's fine. That's nice. But are they telling you everything you need to know? This church will tell you everything you need to know. This pastor will tell you everything you need to know. And he didn't ask me to say that. I promise you. But if you want everything you need, you've got to get to the place where you can hear the voice of God. And if you've got too many distractions in your life, you will not hear his voice. Now, God is not up in heaven, as it were, with a carrot on the end of a string. He's like, come get it, come get it. And as soon as you get close, he goes, whoop. God's not like that. God is not playing games with the human race. He wants us to have this. But God has certain criteria to meet. But it's not complicated. It's not beyond our understanding. Anybody here get the Holy Ghost when you were a little child? Oh, I see some hands. How old were you? Seven. How old were you? Seven, how old were you, Bethany? Six, how old were you, bro? Ten, how old were you, bro? Hallelujah. (laughs) Amen. Anybody get it younger than six? You get my point. Again, it's not a competition. What I'm saying is God made this simple. In fact, he said for children, he said, come with childlike faith. I can't hear his voice if I'm so full of pride and I know it all and, man, I got this sewn up and nobody's going to tell me what to do and ain't nobody going to rule my life and I am my own man. You know, that guy can hear the voice of God like that. I got to submit myself to the man of God and listen, when he gets up in this pulpit and he has a word from the living God, I got to humble myself and be willing to hear what thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes our own minds, the mind is a battleground, is heavily influenced by our own imagination. And as a child of God, you and I, we want to affect our world for the gospel. We want to see people come to Jesus Christ, right? Well, if we're whacked out and we're weird, and we're, I'm not saying you are, you're not, but if we're, if we're out in left field somewhere and we don't have our head screwed on straight and we're not thinking right, we can't affect our world for positive change, for revival, for a Holy Ghost harvest and move of the Spirit. That's why the Bible says when, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. But he also said in 2 Corinthians 10, cast down imaginations. So Satan wants to keep you tripped up. He wants to keep you depressed. Satan wants to keep you doubting your own victory. I can't help someone else have victory if I don't have victory myself. No, no, in no way, shape, or form am I suggesting that you should wait until you are picture perfect before you try to help somebody else because that's unrealistic too. You, you, you got to just, at some point, you just got to dig in and start doing a work for, for God. But what I'm saying is if, if you're full of depression, what's going to ooze out of your pores? get around somebody that's like they're just so depressed you ever get around somebody that's so negative everything that comes out of their mouth is negative 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 you know 
and, and everything they say is doubt. And yeah, I just don't want to be around people that are so negative, 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 negative. I want to be around people that use their voice to speak faith. Now, I am not saying people that are unrealistic. I am not saying that you don't look at situations realistically and address them for what they are. But at some point when you're facing a challenge, you've got to have enough faith in your spirit where you speak to the mountain. You see, real faith doesn't ignore reality. Real faith acknowledges, yes, there may be a mountain in the way. There may be a challenge. There may be a sickness, yes. But God rises to the challenge, and he uses us to do so. And he uses your voice and my voice to speak his promise, to speak his word. In 2017, don't allow yourself to use your voice to speak doubt. Yes, acknowledge when you're faced with a challenge. But they say, you know what? God has a promise. God, because people come here for one reason. They need hope. For a relationship with Jesus Christ. There are also other voices that influence us. And they influence culture. Now, we cannot silence all those voices, but we can be the voice God intended for us to be. We all hear voices growing up, voices at home, parents, siblings, voices at school. Now, those are huge. The voices you heard in your home as a child, I was very blessed and privileged, even though I wasn't raised in church. I heard positive voices most of the time. My parents regularly told me they loved me and used their voices to encourage me. Yeah, I heard occasional arguing, but they didn't, like, get in my face and scream until veins were popping out of their forehead and, you know, throw me up against the wall and kick me and stuff. I mean, my parents were loving. They were kind. They used their voice to speak gently to me and all of this. And so I'm very blessed, but I'm also very conscious of the fact not everybody was so privileged. Some people I meet never heard their parents, if they even know who their real parents are, never heard their mom and dad regularly say, I love you. I've met people who said, yeah, I know who my parents are, but they never, ever said, I love you. I cannot imagine that. Now, I understand sometimes we say things in passing and we, and, and we don't really think about what we're saying. You know, an example is, how you doing? Well, we don't really mean that. You ever have someone say to you, how are you? How, are you? how you doing? How's it going? And, and when you give them an answer, they kind of look at you like, oh, I didn't mean for you to answer that question. <laughs> You know, the Bible warns against vain words. I didn't intend on getting into some of this stuff. But what I want us to focus on is that God gave us the precious gift of having a voice. And Pastor and I did not talk about this before service. But you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the rocks And it just now entered my oxygen-enriched brain that, hey, I don't want just to be someone who fills a seat and does nothing. If you are a voice of praise, you are as valuable as the most eloquent preacher in any pulpit in the world because your voice is golden in the ears of God when it is sincere and when it is lifted up not to impress not to put on a show not just to sound good and all of you sound great when I get caught up in him I forget about who's around me And I don't really care 
if my clothes aren't perfect and my hair's not perfect, it's never going to be anyway. Look at it. It's a mess. Who cares? I don't care about all that. What I care about is pleasing him and doing his will and following in his ways. But if you want to make right choices in 2017, young people, you've got to be listening to the right voices. Listen to this man, your pastor. He loves you. He loves you. As he follows Jesus Christ, he loves you. And he's following Jesus Christ. Listen to the voice of your shepherd. I'm telling you, it'll keep you from trouble. A lot of it. You'll be so thankful one day that you listened to God's word and the shepherd he gave you. I normally don't spend this much time saying stuff like this. Beware of the subtle voice of the enemy who would question the truths of God's word. Because if you go back to the very beginning, Satan didn't come in with a screaming, ugly voice to Adam and Eve. His voice was the slick, well-polished, pleasant voice of a used car salesman. Nothing against used car salesmen. We need good, honest ones. And you may sell cars, and God bless you, and praise God. I'm, it's just an illustration. Don't be offended. I stole that line from Merle Cornwell, okay, the Bible study guy. <laughs> How did Satan get into the mind of Adam and Eve? He questioned God's voice. And when they listened to the serpent, they made the wrong choice because they listened to the wrong voice. And as the musicians come, I close with this true story. You know I got saved in 1986, full of the Holy Ghost, as I told you, and baptized. A few years later, in 1989, I graduated from high school in 1988. Actually, it was the fall of 1988 that I migrated uh, two hours across the Altamont Pass to Stockton. And I went to CLC. And so I'm still a teenager finding myself in the San Joaquin Valley going to Christian Life College. And at the time, I know you probably find this hard to believe, I was somewhat introverted in 1989. <clears throat> Some of that was by choice because, you know, I came out of a heavy party lifestyle in 1985 when I was 14 years old and 15, and it was just, I was trying to just stay away from the whole party scene. And so I was somewhat introverted. Well, Bethany's mother is from Illinois. My wonderful wife of 26 years, Melissa. And uh, she kind of helped me overcome the introverted way when we started courting there in dating in Stockton. And uh, I asked her to marry me. I took her to the top of Bear Valley Ski Resort. In, in several feet of snow, and I proposed to her. And we set our wedding date for August 4th, 1990. Well, she went back to Illinois in between semesters, in the summer, actually, and this, this is a true story. She, she went there to prepare for the wedding, so I'm alone in hot, baking Stockton, working in a lumber yard. But it was a blessing because it was... An income. So <clears throat> I had a little townhouse that I was staying in all by myself that we were going to move into after our wedding. Anyway, why am I telling you all this? I don't know. <clears throat> well, all the while, since I got the Holy Ghost in 86, I'd been praying for my parents to come back to Jesus and be refilled with the Holy Ghost. And, and, and I can't put into words that burden. But anyone who, who you, you know that burden, when you're praying for a loved one, you want them to be saved. And I have that same burden for, for my son that uh, 
God's going to refill him with the Holy Ghost. So I'm praying this every day, every day. I was determined to see my mom and dad be refilled with the Holy Ghost. And so I'm, I'm like I said, I'm engaged, <clears throat> 1990, and I'm, I, I was, I'd worked 10 hours or so that day, hot. I was just, I was sweaty. I was yucky. And I got back to my townhouse. Now, back then, we had telephones that had cords that went into the wall. Does anybody here remember that? We used to actually have that. And so I had a 1983 Mazda 626. I parked it. And as I was walking to the door of the townhouse, I heard the phone ringing. And I hurried up and I got my key out of my pocket open the door, burst open the door, and I grabbed the phone. Did I tell you this already? Anyway. Okay, good. <laughs> and I, I hurried up and I got the phone, and I said, hello, like a normal human being would do. And there was nobody on the other end of the line. Now, this is analog phones. This is before digital stuff came in. And so back then, if you call somebody, if you hang up, the connection is still there for about 30 seconds. So even if you hang up, you can pick the phone back up and they're still there. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that. Well, I learned that from like the 70s when I used to crank call as a kid. Which don't do this at home <laughs> or in your car. <laughs> so I knew, I kept, here's the thing, I thought it was a crank caller. But when I first went to answer the phone, I thought it was my wife, Melissa, or my fiancé back then, calling me to tell me how much she's looking forward to marrying me. And we're going to talk about wedding plans, you know, and all this stuff. And so I was excited. A good way to end an exhausting day. Talk to her, you know. Brighten my evening. Well, nobody said hello. Nothing. I heard no voice. Talking about voices, right? So... Out of frustration, I said, I'm ah, just another crank, some crank caller punk kid. I hung up the phone. Now, I knew this. I left it hung up like for a minute. I should have had a dial tone, my brother. When I picked the phone back up, still no dial tone. I hung up several times, and I could not get a dial tone, Pastor. I was mad by now. And I, I'm angry. And uh, so, believe it or not, the Lord spoke to me at that moment. It wasn't audible. It was, you know, an impression in my mind. And I felt the still, small voice of God in my frustration say, pray for that person, Craig, on the other end of the line. I got the phone. In my, well, I'd been hearing Lee Stone King talk about praying people through to the Holy Ghost on airplanes and stuff. So I thought, well, if he can do that, I can pray someone through on the phone. That's what faith does, you know. One thing leads to another. So I thought, all right, that's how they were teaching us in college. Pray for people everywhere. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to pray for this person. And I felt the Lord speak to me. So I had the phone to my ear. No one said hello. No dial tone. I heard nothing, but my phone was ringing. My phone was ringing, remember? So I'm praying for this person, whoever they are. I thought I'm praying for some little kid just having fun crank calling people. That's what I thought. And, I'm, and so, you know, it's like uh, you're wasting your time. No, I'm trying to obey God. So I'm praying, praying, and I st the things that I'm saying, my brother, are like, you will repent in the name of Jesus I command you to repent. Well, who gave you the authority to say that? <laughs> I don't know. I just pray like I feel. And I'm praying, and then I pray, I command the chains of darkness to be broken. Well, here, here's what started coming out of my mouth. I, I start to feel the Holy Ghost take over my prayer. Phone to my ear, in my apartment, and this is what started coming out of my mouth. You will come back to God. God is restoring you. All of a sudden, my prayers transitioned, and I'm praying for a backslider. But I didn't know who this person was. I had no clue. Well, after about 15 minutes, Pastor, my prayers transitioned into speaking in tongues. And I mean to tell you, my apartment was hot on fire with the power of God. Hallelujah. 
And if you had come in my little townhouse, you would have thought I was kind of crazy. Because I, doing this with the phone to my ear, with a long, stretchy, twirly cord going to the wall, and now I'm dancing, victory dances in the spirit, and I'm praying, I'm speaking in tongues, and if nothing else, I'm getting the victory. You know, I'm still in my lumberjack clothes. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. This went on for 20 minutes with the phone to my ear. I'm dancing all over the little kitchen. Still, I heard nothing, no dial tone, no voice, nothing. And all of a sudden, after about 20 minutes, that my phone was ringing. I hear a little voice. Craig, is that you? I instantly recognized the voice in my spiritual, deep spiritual discernment as my mother. <laughs> I was kidding about the deep spiritual discernment part. <laughs> and my mom, now look, now this is true. This is a true story. I'm not making any of this up. It really happened. My mom said, Craig, are you praying? I said, Mom, I've been praying for 20 minutes with the phone to my ear. My phone was ringing 20 minutes ago. Right, I just got home from work. She said, Craig, I'm in Half Moon Bay. Well, they lived in San Jose. Half Moon Bay, you know, was quite a ways away. She was at a friend's house. I knew where she was. Her friend was Judy. I never talked to Judy on the phone, ever. Judy never called me. My mom had never called me from Judy's phone. My mom was at Judy's house. Now, this is the, the, the creepy part, but when you know it's God, it's not really creepy. My mom said to me, Craig, I, feel, I start feeling the Holy Ghost even more, you know, like chill bumps and stuff. And she said, Craig. Someone needs to hear this. She said, Craig, I just now picked up the phone. My fingers did not touch one button on the dial pad. She said, as soon as I picked up the phone, there you were praying. My phone was ringing 20 minutes ago. Who called me? Who connected our phone line? Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus. Hey. If he can raise Lazarus from the dead... He can connect a phone line to tell a backslider there's hope. You're going to be refilled. You're going to be okay. God loves you. By this time, my mom's crying. You can stand. I'm, I'm almost done. I promise. You need a miracle today. I want to tell you the rest of the story. I want to tell you the rest of the story. Everything I prayed in that prayer that I didn't know, I had no clue who I was praying for. It was a supernatural miracle. God connected our phone line. Why would God do that? Just to impress me that he could connect a phone line? No, I don't think so. God is not in the business of just trying to impress us. He knows he's God. He's not trying to prove to us that he's God. He doesn't have to do that. All you have to do is step out on a starry night, look at the stars, and there's all the proof you need that there's a God. And there's, we could come up with hundreds of examples of the existence of God in creation. God doesn't have to prove to anybody who he is. He knows who he is, and he's, just, he's doing just fine, thank you. But he loves us and he wants to be connected to his most precious creation, the human race. He loves us more than anything else he created. You are the most important thing. You're not a thing, but you're the most important to God out of everything in the universe. You are God's number one priority. Amen. Amen. And my mom was sobbing at this point. And she even told me, she said, there is no way to explain how our phones connected except that God, it wasn't redial. I already explained that. It wasn't any of, no technology glitch, nothing. There is no way my phone could have connected to her friend's phone. She never touched a button. My phone was ringing. It was a miracle. But again, why? 
God was showing my mother that he's never forgotten about her. But it wasn't by accident. And I say this with all humility. God used my three years of praying for them to bring about that miracle. You see, I'm all for instant miracles. I'm sure we've all had God do things for us before the prayer even comes out of our mouth. But then there are those answers to prayer that are the result like Cornelius where God said your prayers are come up as a memorial before God. Those are months and years of your voice going up and you don't know how it happens but it stacks up somehow in heaven like on a hard drive. And it gets to a point where God looks at one of his angels and says, it's time. Spread your wings and fly, angel, if they have wings. Go go get them. Go do it. Go, go bring forth the miracle. Go heal them. Go deliver them. Go break the chains. My parents are a work in progress, but I want to tell you something. It wasn't too long after that that repentance did take place and refilling of the Holy Ghost did take place. And I, and, and I don't care how desperate your scenario may seem. You are never out of reach of the hand of God. But if you want to make right choices in 2017, you must hear the right voices and there's one voice we must never ignore and that's the voice of our Savior Jesus Christ just like your spouse would be insulted when you ignore their voice how many times have we grieved the heart of our maker when he tries to speak to us because God doesn't speak to us the way the world speaks to us God doesn't need a billboard on the interstate God doesn't need pop-up ads on the web. God's dimension is much, much, much better. He speaks in the deepest part of our emotions. And it's always with gentle love. You may be in this building right now feeling pressed down with shame because of whatever past choices you have made or maybe even circumstances beyond your control have left you feeling and wondering if you matter at all. I'm here to tell you the voice of God is speaking and He's saying, come unto me. Come unto me. I will never reject you. I will never cast you out. But there has to, you have to reach a crossroads where you make a decision God is not going to force you. You have to make the choice. I am going to hear his voice. And I am going to respond. And I am not going to let anything get in my way. Would you lift your hands all over this sanctuary right now? Jesus, we love you. We love you. And as the house of God.